So we don't have, don't you love that? Updating, updating, updating. So we don't have a signal going out and we don't have, our people at home are not able to see us right now. So, yay. All right. I guess you might have been able to tell that one of my all time favorite movies is The Wizard of Oz. I am surprised to learn there are a number of you who have not ever seen that movie. I have it in DVD and VHS if in fact you would like to, to look at that. So, and I, by the way, I don't mean some adaptation or stage play, I mean the actual 1939 classic, Wizard of Oz. Um, it's one of my, and then one of my all-time favorite scenes in my all-time favorite movie is that moment when Dorothy emerges from her tornado-launched house into Munchkinland. All right, I'm going to paint a picture for those of you who've never seen it. Up to that point in the movie, it has been black and white. Dorothy's living in Kansas, everything's black and white, and she opens the door in Munchkin land, and the world is filled with color. Not just color, but color, right? Dorothy is utterly amazed. It is as if, as if the world has simply exploded in glory before her eyes. And Maybe even it's as if something has existed all along that she's only now beginning to see and perceive. I think we might be able to draw a parallel there with the teaching of the church that, there, that our God is triune in nature, three persons in one God. Today is Trinity Sunday, the day that preachers all over the world dread. <laughs> Am I right? I got a couple of preachers and they're like, uh huh. They showed up today to see what I did. Yeah, Woo. Personally, I think we could rename this Sunday Divine Sense of Humor Sunday because I suspect that God might get a kick out of how our, the, the preachers of the world are trying to explain this concept while desperately of trying to avoid heresy at the same time. You know, it's like the duck who's paddling underneath that looks very calm on top, right? As far as I'm aware, it is nobody's favorite Sunday to preach. And uh, not so much because the Trinity is such a terribly complicated or unknown doctrine, more because it tends to remind us preachers that we don't know anywhere near as much as we sometimes like to think we do. And even more so, it's that words fail when we try to describe the Trinity, when we try to do the Trinity justice. In fact, words can defeat us, at least me, when I make any kind of paltry attempt to describe God and the experience of God. There's something about the Trinity that asks us to understand God beyond words or intellect. The Trinity tells us that we can't pin God down to just one experience of God. You see, God is a lot bigger, a lot more alive, a lot more than we are and that we can understand and that certainly we can even speak about. But despite that warning that I just gave primarily to myself, Let's talk about the Trinity. The first thing to note, let's get out in front of this one right away, is the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. In truth, there are only a handful of places in Scripture, a handful of verses that even take a swipe at the concept. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are mentioned all together in just a couple of places, like in telling us to go and make disciples or in telling us how to baptize. In today's gospel, as in many other places, Jesus talks about the Father, and he talks about the Advocate that we learned about last week. But even there, I'm utterly delighted to see that Jesus warns, while there are many things, he has many things to tell us, there are things we just cannot bear right now. I suspect the nature of the triune God might just be one of them. Sometimes, when we dig into this idea of the Trinity, we may err on the side of simplicity. 
For example, our catechism, found in the back of your prayer book, you know that place where a few dare to go? It simply says this, question, what is the Trinity? Answer, the Trinity is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Great. Can't get more streamlined than that, right? But tell me, does that help us to understand the idea of the Trinity better than we did before? Not really. Maybe some of you remember a time in the olden days when the Catholic Church had something called the Baltimore Catechism. Some of us had to memorize parts of it. Written like ours in a series of questions and answers, it gives a little more information about the Trinity. Question. What do you mean by the Blessed Trinity? Answer. By the Blessed Trinity, I mean one God in three divine persons. Question. Are the three divine persons equal in all things? Answer. The three divine persons are equal in all things. Question. Are the three divine persons one and the same God? Answer. The three divine persons are one and the same God, having one and the same divine nature and substance. Okay, how are we doing there? Does that help? Does adding more words actually add more meaning to us? No, not really. Actually, some of those specialty words like nature and substance and persons kind of muddy the water a little bit for us in a way. So instead of trying to distill it down to a simple formula, maybe we need to check out what some of the heavy hitters in our uh, founding, uh, the foundings of our faith had to say about it. The early fathers of our faith, and I say the word fathers here deliberately, not because I don't think women had uh, either existed or had anything to say. It's just that it seems that only the men's ideas have gotten down to us so far through the centuries. Anyway, the early fathers, they went through all sorts of contortions to explain the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and that relationship. To hear how it finally settled out, you only need to turn the page in your bulletin because the Nicene Creed, which took nearly 400 years to come together, it, it was made largely to instruct the faithful in the doctrine of the Trinity and to defend it against a whole variety of heresies that had arisen. There certainly are a lot of words there, no doubt. We say them every Sunday. But do they really add to our understanding of this three-in-one God? It seems that we can keep throwing words out, layer upon layer, and not get much further in our understanding. That's what made me think of the Wizard of Oz and that scene in Munchkin Land. All right, so sometime back, I heard a podcast talking about sight and how human sight compares to the sight that the different animals possess. We've probably all heard that dogs are colorblind, which, by the way, isn't strictly true. It's just that they do perceive color. It's just that they have only two color receptor cones in their eyes, and uh, they receive blue and yellow. Now, humans, we, we're far superior. We have three color receptor cones, and so we have blue, yellow, and red. That increases the colors that we can see exponentially. It's not just red, you see, it's all the purples and all the oranges and all the stuff in between. But before we get to thinking how superior our side is, it's interesting to learn that bees and butterflies have four color receptor cones. Hmm. They can see all the colors that we see and more. And what's more, they can see ultraviolet light. Turns out many flowers that we perceive to be a, a lovely shade of yellow or coral or some other color also have a big fat strip of ultraviolet, a, a, like a landing strip there, so that the pollinators can see it and get into that flower. We can't even see that. Like Dorothy, we aren't even aware that that exists. But wait, lest you think you start, should start to envy the bees and the butterflies. Wait until you hear about the mantis shrimp. <laughs> famous, famous animal, mantis shrimp, not really. Typically found in tropical and subtropical waters. It's only about four inches long. The thing about them 
is that for some reason they have, uh, as neuroscientists have been able to determine so far, won the grand prize for vision in all living things. Their eyes have a whopping 16 color um, receptor cones. Yeah, imagine, not only can they see so many more colors than we can, they can also see the ultraviolet light, light, like the bees and the butterflies, and something called polarized light. Now, I read everything I could about what the heck polarized light is, and I'm not to this day even sure what it is, much less how I could possibly even begin to describe it to those of us who cannot see it. So I imagine that I can kind of see what it would be like to see like a dog, right? I can subtract colors from my sight a little bit, to some extent, wrap my head around their vision. I mean, I have watched a lot of my TV, right? I can even maybe think about what it might be like to see like a bee or a butterfly, like a mantis shrimp, their vision. That one is impossible for me to even imagine. Similarly, I can think about Jesus. He lived and he died just like us. So that's pretty easy for me to grasp. I can begin to wrap my head around God Almighty, although the concept of a being that always was and always will be, that's where it starts to get a little daunting, right? And I can even stretch a little bit, get maybe a whisper of the Holy Spirit coming into focus for me. <laughs> But figuring out how they're connected with each other and how they act and interact in concert with each other, I may as well be trying to explain what a mantis shrimp sees. On this podcast that I was listening to, they use music to help me understand. I want to digress here a little bit and tell you about this guy named Jeremy Begbie. He's a theologian and a musician, and he currently teaches at Duke University. He is a heavy hitter of our time, and that his resume includes Cambridge and St. Andrews, and he's been doing theology for a long time. He's got a lot to say about the Trinity, and he also uses music to help people understand, and that's where this podcast and the theology kind of come together. In fact, according to Big B, the way they, that we see or hear the world can help us see or understand the Trinity. His main point is that when we think about vision, no matter how much color a being can perceive, you can only see one thing in one space at a time. It doesn't matter if you're a dog or a butterfly or a, excuse me, a mantis shrimp, two objects cannot exist in exactly the same space at the same time. If they do, one hides the other or or they overlap and you can only see parts of each of them, right? But when we hear music, multiple notes can take up the same space and we hear them all. The notes can be inside or on top of or weaving through each other and they are still distinct and yet they come together. So I wanna try a little experiment. Cam's been working on something for me since badly, since yesterday afternoon. <laughs> When I came up with this, thank you, Pam. She's going to play us a little melody. Go ahead, Pam, hit it. Just the single. That's lovely, isn't it? It's a. Uh, it's. We heard it all. It was complete. It filled our ears. But now, Pam's going to play that same melody, and she's going to add a few more notes to it. Okay, you're going to just add a note? So that's clearly our same melody, but it's got a lot more notes to it. And most of the time, as Pam said, it's like two notes together but it's still very recognizable. We can still hear it all, but it's definitely richer and fuller. Now finally, Pam's gonna play us the piece the way the composer wrote it, the way the composer 
hope that we would be able to hear it. Could you hear all those notes? You really could, couldn't you? None of them drowned out the others. Instead, they worked together to enhance and enlarge the melody. I mean, that's just one instrument. Imagine a symphony orchestra or a symphony orchestra and a kazoo band and a, you know, a zydeco band and uh, Irish jig music all playing at the same time, right? We can hear it all. It's as if all the colors are being used to paint the picture of the sound. That, my friends, is perhaps just a little glimpse of what the Trinity is like. God, almighty maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life. They can fill the same space and they can be heard distinctly. They are the threeness and the oneness that we, with our paltry, sad little language, call God. Like musical notes, not only can they be in the same space, but they can actually work in concert with each other and enhance each other's work. Thinking about the Trinity is truly an exercise in recognizing the breadth and depth in which God makes God's self known to us. It's also about recognizing that even though we can hear all those notes at once and appreciate all the beautiful music they make, this side of glory, we have still only a sliver, only a rudimentary grasp of the fullness of God. So, you know what? We, we don't worship a God who created this world and set it into motion. We don't worship a guy who walked around 2,000 years ago and did some miracles. We don't worship a spirit that we can feel when we see a beautiful sunset or a new baby's face. We worship this amazing, incredible, rich, full, indescribable, whole God. The one that works together to create and to redeem and to inspire us always. Amen. Amen. Thanks, ma'am.
God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. To give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For with your co-eternal Son and Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons and in unity of being. And we celebrate the one and equal glory of you, O Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, and in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In Christ you have delivered us from evil, you have made us worthy to stand before you. In Christ, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we reclaim Christ's resurrection, we await Christ's coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Savior of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through whom we are made acceptable to you, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with James and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your children through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation by Christ and with Christ and in Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever, amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Please stand as you are able. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Savior, amen. All right, announcements. Uh, are there any birthdays or anniversaries that need, or other Thanksgivings or excitement or whatever? Anything else needs celebrating today? Can I grab, yeah, thank you. Well, hi there. Hi. What's your name? Sally Allenby. And Sally, what are you here for? I'd like to pray for my son's birthday vicariously. He'll be 60-something. You do not have a 60-something-year-old son. What's his name? Thomas. Thomas. And where was Thomas born? Los Angeles, California. Wow. Well, we'll forgive you for that. Yeah. It's all right. Some of us did take little roots through California in life, but it's okay. We come back to the promised land eventually. And uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's somebody else in our... Uh, Rebecca Gearlings, Becky, and Brian Olson. So these are the people we'll keep in our thoughts as we pray, starting on page 16. Watch over your children, O Lord. As their days increase. May God bless and guide Thomas this day and every day for the rest of his life. Amen. Every him who is scourged or sorrowful, raise them up if they fall, and in their hearts may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Thank you. Tell Thomas happy birthday. And happy birthday, Becky and Brian. So I only have a couple of things to point out. Uh, we did not do the graduates this week yet because we only had one turned in. Come on. Don't we know more graduates than that? So if you had anybody graduate in your family, there's, there are instructions uh, to have them turned in this coming Wednesday. You can call the office and just leave, hi, this is John Smith and my niece Guinevere graduated with, you know, whatever it is, uh, a degree in marine biology, and she can tell Beth about mantis shrimp, and so um, uh, that would be great. Uh, and then we all pray for those folks, I'm hoping, by next week. This coming Tuesday night is book group. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, woman, the book woman's daughter. So if you haven't started it, get reading, girls. Excuse me. Women of stature, people. <laughs> Sorry. Shouldn't say stuff like that. And uh, we will be having coffee hour on the porch. Um, the, we had a Curcio meeting here yesterday. And... Uh, someone who shall remain nameless but was mostly me overbought donut holes so hope you're hungry for donut holes because we got a lot of them so come on in have a few donut holes i what can i say i'm a anything else for the good of the order then if you'll stand i'll leave you with this blessing god who made you loves you God who redeemed you, loves you. God who sanctifies you, loves you. And may the blessing of God who loves you, the one holy and undivided Trinity, be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 371, Thou Whose Mighty Word.
Go in peace to love and serve Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thanks be to God.